to a couple of PAG meetings at this point, and we're starting to hear um, with respect to the DBO a little bit more about ocean acidification, but we're just sort of getting started with integrating these couple of things. So that's what I wanted to walk through today. So we'll start out by talking a little bit about OA uh, in coastal Alaska and then spend more of a lot of our time talking about uh, how ocean acidification integrates with the DBO and then what steps we might be able to take moving forward. Hmm. Trying to advance slides and it is not working for me. Okay. How about that? Yeah. Oop. There we go. Okay, so many of you will be familiar with this graph. This is showing the Mauna Loa Observatory's record of CO2 increases um, over the past uh, five years. Um, as you can see, CO2 in the atmosphere is increasing, and despite our best efforts through conferences and um, global agreements like COP21 and the recent Paris Agreement and the UN Conference on Climate Change, it's very likely that CO2 in the atmosphere is going to continue to increase. So as CO2 increases in the atmosphere, um, we also start to absorb that CO2 into the surface ocean. And we've really just gotten started uh, in Alaska and in the Arctic with measuring what the impact of that CO2 is going to be on the surface ocean. We expect it, especially in the Bering Sea, which is what is shown in these monthly maps here, uh, that CO2 fluxes into the ocean would be astronomically large because we have such a highly productive ecosystem here. Lots of phytoplankton, lots of photosynthesis, very efficient biological pump, sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. But um, as you'll notice along the bottom row, uh, there are some orange colors there, which means that the surface ocean is actually releasing some CO2 back into the atmosphere in fall. So as the CO2 builds up from the respiration of these big phytoplankton blooms, um, remineralization produces CO2 again, it effluxes into the atmosphere. And overall, the Bering Sea ends up being a pretty moderate sink of CO2. Um, we were also somewhat surprised by what we could see of CO2 fluxes in the Arctic region, which is shown in these Arctic maps. Um, the first thing I want to point out is that obviously many of these maps look a little bit empty. Um, there's a handful of data points in Canada, but overall it's pretty hard to get into the Arctic in the middle of winter to measure CO2 fluxes, as I'm sure many of you might be familiar with for your own work. Um, but based on the information that we have, um, it actually ended up being that the PAR was a little bit bigger of a sink than we anticipated. And as a matter of fact, um, that sink is very likely to increase. So if you look at the difference between the, um, sh the, uh, sh the green and the red lines um, and the blue lines, and then the black line, especially in January here at the beginning um, and over here in December, there's a pretty big gap uh, between those two sets of lines. So um, these green, red, and blue lines are all conceptions of how sea ice currently looks in, in the Pacific Arctic region, whereas the black is what would happen if we just took all of the sea ice away, which is what is gradually going to happen in the PAR. And as we take sea ice away, um, it's very likely that the CO2 sink in the Arctic is not only bigger than we thought it was, but is going to keep increasing. And that's just without any increase in primary production, that's just the increase in open water. So we have this massive CO2 sink in the Arctic um, that, was, that was a lot bigger than we expected it would be. So ultimately, the impact of this CO2 actually has um, um, massive impacts, massive cascading impacts on the chemistry of the Arctic Ocean. Um, what this plot is showing you here is the global distribution of surface water aragonite saturation states. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the phrase saturation state or with the um, term aragonite, uh, what happens is that as the CO2 is absorbed into the ocean, it causes a cascade of chemical impacts, one of which is a reduction in the availability of carbonate mineral ions. Um, these mineral ions are something that many calcifying marine organisms use to build shells, skeletons, and tests. Uh, and taking them away is sort of like taking lumber away from somebody who's trying to build a house. So carbonate ions are actually pretty scarce in the Arctic already. That's what's indicated by these lower values, these lower um, cool colors that you can see up in and around Alaska. So as we add CO2 and we take more of those carbonate ions away, um, we start to have a pretty big um, and pretty fast impact on the carbonate chemistry in the Arctic. So in the Bering Sea, um, we'll jump right into what we're actually seeing in the DBO. Um, the, 
this ocean acidification and this natural preconditioning that's occurred over you know geological time scales is not the only thing that can impact um, saturation states. As I was talking about earlier, the biological pump is a really big factor. Um, so in the Bering Sea, as you have these big um, sea ice blooms that produce tons and tons of organic matter that's very heavy, it cannot be grazed fast enough when the sea ice retreats, it all sinks down to the bottom. And just like you would see um, uh, an increase in nutrients at the bottom from your remineralization, we also see the same thing with respect to carbonate. And in the DB01 area, which is just southwest of St. Lawrence Island, uh, we actually have some evidence that these undersaturations, though seasonal, last for a pretty extended period of time. Uh, that's what's being shown in the scatter plot up here. So essentially, when we threw our mooring in, um, we almost immediately exceeded a PCO2 that um, indicated that the water would be undersaturated, and we achieved pretty severe undersaturations pretty quickly after that. So there's at least 90 days of, of severe undersaturations that are occurring in the bottom waters at this particular site. Um, and on top of that, we can also see that these corrosive conditions are actually causing dissolution of some carbonate minerals, and that's what's shown uh, in this section plot down here. So these warm colors indicate dissolved carbonate um, that's just hanging out in the water column excess to what we would expect. So we don't know what is dissolving, but we do know that something is dissolving uh, in the Bering Sea, and that's in conjunction with DB01. Um, Jackie and her student Christina and I are starting to look into records of um, uh, clams, right? Isn't it, Jackie? That's right. Yep, clams uh, in this particular area to see whether or not there's been an impact of ocean acidification on that particular population. Uh, the advantage of working with the DBO and working uh, especially with Jackie is that she's got a pretty long time series, so we're hoping to see something come out of that pretty soon. So again, just like I told you that, you know, uh, that ocean acidification is really having this a, a big impact in the subsurface. Um, this is a synthesis paper that I'm working on right now. Uh, and the cool colors that you can see in this plot are undersaturations or a value of the aragonite saturation state that is less than one that indicates a chemical tendency towards dissolution of carbonate minerals. So cool colors, ocean acidification event. Um, and uh, most of these cool colors are coinciding with some of the DBO regions that you see. Um, uh, Nick Bates actually did an aerial estimate and said that about 40% of the Chukchi Sea benthos is exposed to bottom waters um, that are corrosive uh, and may start impacting these organisms. So the reason that we see all of these corrosive waters uh, in the Pacific Arctic region and in our DBO boxes is actually the result of the same things that we want to study with the DBO, right? These are highly productive regions. Um, there, there are active food webs in these areas. That's why we put the DBO hotspot boxes exactly where they were. Um, but the main underpinning of all of those ecosystems is this massive phytoplankton production. And where you have massive phytoplankton production, you probably have massive remineralization that's going on in the bottom waters. Um, so these cool colors, and that's what I'm showing in this um, scatter plot that's in the upper right over here, um, uh, these cool colors, these undersaturations are occurring in conjunction with Pacific winter water. Um, so this water forms, um, it's really high in nutrient concentrations as a result of this respiration where you have high nutrients, you have high carbon, and so these waters are undersaturated too. So especially in the late summer and early fall, um, any organisms that are sort of relying on this biological pump for food are also going to be impacted by these ocean acidification events. So when we talk about organismal impacts, though, we have to be really careful. Um, at the very beginning of ocean acidification studies, we sort of relied on the idea that um, saturation states less than one are bad. You know, any kind of chemical favorability for dissolution is going to have an impact on organisms. But the truth is that we're moving beyond that. Um, organisms are a lot more complex than we gave them credit for at the beginning. Uh, this is not a stepwise threshold, and different species and different organisms respond in different ways. Um, so now, as geochemists, we're starting to adopt a, a definition of an OA event that, that uh, really respects that complexity a lot more. And so we say when, you know, your saturation state passes outside the range of natural variability of the particular environment that you're dealing with, you may achieve an impact on organisms. So this may indicate that some organisms may start exhibiting an impact at saturation states well above one, uh, well above the point when we would expect um, chemical dissolution to be favored. Or it may be that some organisms are more resilient than we expected and may not exhibit any impact uh, even when saturation states are below one. So here's an example of that. So this is showing um, 
uh, uh, larval production. Uh, and so you can see that at a saturation state of about 1.8, um, this uh, linear relationship uh, starts starts well above one, and we start seeing an in, a decrease in larval production um, well above the threshold of 1.0 that we would expect, and it actually starts um, well above that. So when we talk about ocean acidification, you know, uh, one of the things that we really want to be able to do uh, is, is, is provide this service to the community, right? We want to provide forecasts and projections of what's going to happen to local communities. We want to provide that for fisheries. We want to provide that for scientists who are interested in going out and really constraining some of these biological impacts. Um, and one of the best tools that we have to be able to do that uh, is uh, our models. The models aren't perfect, but they do do a pretty good job, um, and they can tell us when um, saturation states are likely to dip below one. So in this panel on the right-hand side, I'm showing um, the progression of surface water saturation states from 2012 to about 2100. Uh, and you can see, especially in the PAR, uh, by 2050, we have pretty widespread undersaturations. Again, that's these cool colors. Uh, but again, we have to be able to move beyond that as geochemists. You know, we like this value of one, this undersaturation as, as one um, uh, uh, idea, because it's really easy for us. All I have to do is draw a line on this scatter plot. So I can take the average surface water saturation state for each basin. The green is the Bering Sea, the blue is the Chukchi, the purple is the Beaufort Sea, and the red is the average of all three of them. And I can say, behold, they cross one at this particular year. That's when we will start seeing impacts. So that's not exactly true, right? So we actually incorporated um, in this particular paper in Oceanography Magazine, just came out in 2015, um, we actually incorporated the natural variability range. Um, and so rather than impact starting to be apparent in the Chukchi Sea in 2030, uh, we do have a little bit more time than that. And, and it's, the models are projecting that surface water saturation states or OA events um, will start having, will start pushing the environment out of the present range of variability by about 2050 um, rather than about 2030. So in the Bering Sea, we can actually do a little bit better than that. Um, when we start talking about impacts on organisms, what we care about, right, is duration, intensity, and extent. You know, how long are these organisms exposed to undersaturated conditions? How severe are those conditions? And the only way that we can really um, uh, uh, achieve an understanding of that with uh, observations is to, is to make seasonal measurements. Um, so that's what this particular panel is showing right here. So we have spring, summer, and fall bottom water under saturations of aragonite. That's pretty soft, soluble mineral, the, the kind that pteropods use. Um, and then we also have calcite in fall on the far right hand side. So you can see that undersaturation start out um, apparent over this really small area in spring. Um, those, the area or the extent of those undersaturations expands from spring through fall, uh, but the intensity also increases, right? So we start out kind of mild, and by the time we get to fall, those undersaturations are pretty severe. So the extent is expanding, the intensity is, ex is, is, is worsening um, to the point that uh, we actually can start chemically favoring dissolution of calcite uh, in the Bering Sea in fall. And again, that's, that's right through our DD01 region. So one of the other ways, other than natural variability, that we can also start talking about the impact of anthropogenic CO2 or a real ocean acidification event is to identify what the impact of um, anthropogenic CO2 is on that particular water chemistry. So in areas where um, undersaturations are all of a sudden new to the ecosystem where we would never have expected to see them before, you can probably expect a response from the organisms uh, because you are starting to chemically favor dissolution and that threshold does have some value. Um, so we can take um, this estimate of 66.5 micromoles per kilogram of anthropogenic CO2 we can then back them out of, the particular, of that particular system. And when we do that, most of our undersaturation disappear. So we can say that undersaturation. Is anybody else hearing gobbledygook? Yeah, it's getting kind of choppy for me, too. Okay, oh, sorry. sorry to interrupt. No, is it okay? I'm hearing fine. Oh. Yeah, Jessica, I think you just need to be sure to be speaking, you know, right into the speaker, because I think if you move away a little bit, it gets kind of warbly. I can do that. I did back away from my desk there for a second. Sorry to stop um, your flow. No, that's good. <laughs> okay, great. 
Um, so when we do back out this anthropogenic CO2, the vast majority of these undersaturations do disappear, um, with the exception that some of the aragonite undersaturations in these bottom waters hang around and fall. However, the duration and the intensity of, of that ocean acidification event at the sort of pre-industrial condition um, uh, is probably not enough to cause dissolution of carbonate minerals. It's pretty weak. Uh, it's not a severe event at all. So especially in that region, um, other than clams, one of the things that we're interested in is spawning of crabs, right? Um, and so if we start to impact the crab populations, that's going to be a pretty big deal for Alaska. Again, you guys already know this because that's where we dropped the DB01 box for a reason, right? So when, again, one of the things that we really want to be able to do um, with, with this information, you know, we go out, we do this chemical monitoring. What we're trying to do is provide um, a service, provide a service for um, uh, local communities and fisheries and stuff like that. Uh, and we call that environmental intelligence, right? We want to give these communities, we want to give these stakeholders actionable items um, or actionable intelligence, this is what you can do to avoid impacts of ocean acidification, or this is what we can do to slow ocean acidification. Um, that's why we're starting to advocate for uh, reductions in CO2 emissions, just like we did with COP21, like I said at the top end of this presentation. Um, so especially in the Arctic, environmental intelligence can be pretty hard to collect, right? We're dealing with um, absolutely massive territory. Uh, so even though we can go out, we can make some measurements, we can start talking about um, the, 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 the ocean acidification events in confined areas, the truth is that in Alaska uh, and in the DBO regions, in the Pacific Arctic region, um, we have to cover not only an area the size of California uh, and the size of the East Coast, uh, but the rest of the contiguous um, U.S. states on top of that. Um, we're really dealing with an overwhelming area. So that area is particularly vast, and that makes it hard to collect actionable environmental intelligence. On top of that, it's also pretty complex, right? So when we want to start talking about the impacts of ocean acidification on the food web, um, that's complicated. And we're just now starting to understand some of these interactions, especially uh, in, in the Pacific Arctic region um, north of Bering Strait. And then, lastly, when we can get out and we do have the money to get out, it's a particularly hazardous place to try and do work. Um, sea ice really limits the capacity that we have to conduct this type of monitoring um, and, and, and do food web research in the Arctic. Uh, it makes it expensive, so we have to focus our efforts. Again, that's one of the motivations that we have for identifying these regions in the DPO. So the best thing that we can do in this situation when we have too much territory to cover, when the science is more complex and we're able to measure, when you know we don't have the tools we need to get out there, uh, we have to throw essentially everything we have at this problem. Uh, we have to get a super great environmental intelligence across multiple scales uh, using multiple tools. Um, so again, ships, probably our bread and butter for the rest for oceanography at this point. Um, it allows us to get um, to the subsurface area, uh, which is one of the things that, uh, or one of the areas that we're really the most interested in with ocean acidification. Um, and then on top of that, these big integrated research projects like that, uh, and like the collaboration that's developing with the DBO, uh, enables us to link those chemical observations with, um, uh, allows us to link those chemical observations not sure somebody's cell phone is Just music. I'm trying to fix this by... There. <laughs> it's like being in an elevator. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm just going to consider it mood music. And we'll yeah. see right. yeah. There you go. Very flexible. Oh. Okay. Thanks. That was sure fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so not only are we using ships and we're using these big integrated research programs, but we're also starting to use surface and subsurface gliders. Um, we can get really great chemical time series from moorings. I presented some of that data to you already. And then NOAA is starting to really heavily invest in technology development that's going to expand our capabilities of, to operate in this particular region. Um, I'm part of a program called ETA, the Innovative Technology for Arctic Exploration Program. Um, and you may have heard about this at AMSS this year or anywhere else that people have been talking about the sail drone. 
Um, this guy is about twice as fast as any other autonomous surface vehicle that's on the market right now, and it's enormous. That thing is the size of a boat. So we can load it down with sensors, we can leave it down for a long time. It has the capacity to cover a pretty large area, and we're really excited about it. Um, if we can attach a winch to it and, and put a CO2 sensor on that winch and start collecting subsurface measurements, Jessica will have a holy grail. Um, so far, we're not actually capable of achieving that yet, but it is something that the program is looking into. Um, we are integrating a map CO2 system or a surface CO2 flux um, system uh, into the sail drone, and we'll, we're hoping to deploy that in the Arctic next year. Um, so we'll be sailing it up through Bering Strait and around the Chukchi and hopefully out into the basin if the ice cooperates with us like it estimates that it probably will. So, but really, integrated environmental intelligence is all about the people, right? We need to be bringing people together to study multiple aspects of this problem. We can't just do chemical monitoring. This is not just about sensors. This is also about integrating our knowledge and, and conducting synthesis operations. Um, so, again, NOAA has an Alaska enterprise for ocean acidification research that's dedicated to studying ocean acidification and its impacts on Alaska coastal waters. Um, that's Libby Jewett, uh, who heads the NOAA OAP program, and Mike Stigler, who is the head of the Alaska Enterprise for OAP. Uh, and then across the bottom row, there's um, Jeremy Mathis, Tom Hurst, Bob Foy, myself, Bob Stone, and um, uh, uh, Dalton, Rob Dalton. Uh, who uh, who are all conducting ocean acidification research in Alaska. And so the enterprise is based on the idea of this three-legged stool. Um, we're not just doing ocean chemistry, uh, but we're also doing species-specific response studies, and that's the kind of stuff that um, uh, the that uh, Bob Foy's group and Tom Hurst's group are doing. Um, they are specifically studying several species of crab. Um, Bob Stone is studying red tree, red tree corals. Um, and, and Tom Hurst is kind of in charge of our ground fish operation with the cod pollock and sand dab studies that he has going on right now. Uh, uh, and then um, we are also taking that chemical monitoring and taking those species response studies and integrating them into bioeconomic forecasts. Modeling. Um, and so there have been a number of studies that have come out so far about that. Uh, you may be familiar with the one um, that was released about the vulnerability of local communities in Alaska to the impact of ocean acidification. So this is based not just on the progression of ocean acidification um, uh, in, you know, in the ocean and its impacts on fisheries, uh, but also whether or not each of these communities has the capacity to cope uh, with that impact, either by replacing protein subsistence communities or replacing work um, uh, uh, when, when fisheries start to decline. So the red areas are the ones that are most at risk. So this is the vulnerability impact, vulnerability study that was recently published in uh, Progress in Oceanography. Uh, and then very recently, um, we also had a study come out in climate change economics that was about ocean acidification impacts on the crab industry. Uh, and we're projecting that by 2065, we're going to have a pretty substantial uh, decrease in red king crab yields if we continue to fish and manage that fishery the same way we have um, uh, and if ocean acidification progresses at the rate that we expect it to. Um, so this is an imminent problem that we're really starting to try to, to integrate into, um, really integrate into management scenarios for these fisheries going forward. Um, on top of that, one of the other networks that we have uh, is the recently formed Alaska Ocean Acidification Network. Uh, and so all of these OAN networks um, are affiliated with IUS, the Integrated Ocean Observing System. And there's regional networks for different places uh, all over the globe, right? So we have some on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Um, we have them in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so these ocean acidification observing networks um, exist in order to link stakeholders and scientists together. Uh, and so if you take a look at the uh, different uh, groups that are represented on the steering committee uh, for the newly formed Alaska Ocean Acidification Network, you'll see that most of them are stakeholders with just a few uh, scientific representatives on top of that. And so if these guys tell us what they're observing or what the impacts on their particular industries are um, and express their observing needs to us, then as scientists, we can be a lot more responsive and start helping build um, some community resilience to the threat of ocean acidification. 
So like I said, this network is actually pretty newly formed in the site. If, if you navigate over to the site, you'll see this bar here that says that it's still under construction and you should check back in June. Um, so uh, we actually, this, this, the decision to form the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network was actually born out of the Ocean Acidification Workshop after AMSS. That's a picture of everybody who was attending there uh, that was hosted by AUS. Um, and Darcy Dugan, uh, who also works with AUS, is, is going to be the coordinator for the network. Uh, but while we were there at that particular workshop, we talked about all of the things that we would want to get out of this particular uh, network, um, some of the things that would really be stakeholder useful, right? Uh, and so we identified a handful of those, and these are similar to um, the other ocean acidification networks um, uh, around the country as well. So we want to get a map of projects together. Again, that's very similar to what the DDO does. Uh, we want to provide links out to data accessibility. Um, and again, that's also sort of built on this on the DBO model, right? That at least we have a metadata repository where we know where data is being collected and who we can ask for it if we have an interest in doing that. Um, we also want to put together an academic library of the, what's being currently being published about ocean acidification in Alaska. But what I really wanted to emphasize to this group and for the DBO is, and, and what's really unique to this particular ocean acidification network is the idea of an expertise database. Um, we want to be able to provide um, a, a list of people that are working on ocean acidification in Alaska, um, whether or not they have funded projects there. And, and by synthesizing this, by getting these people together on a periodic basis, we hope to be able to identify knowledge gaps um, uh, where do we need to do work to resolve unknowns for ourselves? Uh, on top of that, we also want to identify regional priorities. So if we're going to put a time series site in or if we're um, <clears throat> going to install a new mooring, we want to make sure that it's serving um, the, the, the most needs that it possibly can. Um, and at that workshop, I can vouch for the fact that the DBO came up several times, that that is already a hot spot, um, or those hot spots have already been identified, and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So I would be very surprised if the Alaska Ocean Acidification Network didn't adopt the DBO model um, very quickly. On top of that, we also want to talk about best practices and synthesis. And again, this is all on the same model that the DBO is in, and the Pacific Arctic Group PAG is already using. Um, so, and a lot of the same players are in the Ocean Acidification Network. So I'm hoping that we'll all be able to play really well together, we'll be able to share data, and we'll be able to integrate our work um, uh, seamlessly with what's already being done in this particular region. Um, on top of that, I just got back from the third Ocean and High CO2 World Symposium um, uh, that was in Hobart, Australia. So this is a photo of, of everybody who is already there. And um, I heard a lot of great work that was currently being done. I was just telling Sue Moore earlier that the Chinese have uh, a 14-year time series uh, showing the progression of um, ocean acidification um, starting their time series line forms from Bering Strait all the way up into the basin. And you can see the penetration of, of this undersaturated water over time deeper and deeper into the basin. It's a really great study. Um, uh, I hope that to hear more about it soon. Um, the follow-on to that conference was the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network uh, workshop, uh, and we had some breakouts that were focused specifically on the Arctic. Um, and again, I can tell you um, from being present at that workshop that the DBO has been a very successful model for doing Arctic research uh, and for um, really investigating the idea of in environmental intelligence. Um, the difference between the work that happens currently in the Pacific and currently in the Atlantic is that in terms of ocean acidification, um, the Atlantic researchers focus a lot more on geochemistry and there's a lot more ecosystem level work that's being done on the Pacific side. Uh, and so the Atlantic scientists were very interested in adopting um, that DBO model to sort of expand it to this pan-Arctic um, sort of system uh, in, in hopes of, of capitalizing on the great work that we've been doing as, as part of the DBO. Um, and again, um, that's really born out of the idea that the people in that working group are all already working together through the DBO and through PAG. Um, and so uh, we have great connections to the international community already, uh, and I hope that those will only continue to expand. So um, 
this is a brief summary of what I talked about already. You know, I gave you sort of a, a quick and dirty explanation of how ocean acidification works in Alaska. We talked a little bit about the um, CO2 fluxes and the biological pump. Uh, we talked about the progression of ocean acidification and, and how that's likely to continue uh, into the forward using models um, to project uh, when we might start to see some of the, uh, uh, when we might start to exceed some of the natural variability in that particular system. Uh, and then we talked a lot about environmental intelligence, you know, how uh, NOAA in particular and how the international community are prioritizing environmental intelligence and how uh, the different groups that already exist, how that infrastructure uh, is starting to build and work together um, um, uh, on ocean acidification research going forward uh, and how integral the DBO has become to all of those conversations. Uh, so with that, I guess I'll take any questions. Well, thank you, Jessica. That was really an excellent presentation. Uh, thanks for overcoming some of the technological difficulties as well as the MUSAC. Hey, um, no problem. <laughs> any questions for Jessica? Sue, I'll just add a comment. This is Lee Cooper. Um, one of the things that we did in Fairbanks at the ASSW uh, in the Marine Working Group was uh, to put together a funding commitment to help support a DBO workshop in the Atlantic uh, that will be um, uh, coordinated by uh, Norwegian scientists that uh, uh, will be held this fall. So uh, we're, there's some progress being made in that direction. Well, that's great, Lee. Thank, thank you for that. Um, it is really good to hear, Jessica, that the DBO has been a successful model on some of these things and sort of moving uh, people forward in that direction. It's, it always comes down to people being able to work well together, I think. Absolutely, that's the case. And, and you know, you and I were talking about this earlier. You know, the, the advantage of the DBO is that while we might have to put together, you know, a 10-year um, uh, really well-championed version of, of the Bering Sea Project, um, that the, where we actually get to go out and make seasonal measurements, you know, with a with a refined funding commitment, um, uh, 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 that that's really difficult to do, and that doesn't happen very often. But on the DBO model, we might actually be able to get seasonal measurements in the Arctic or several occupations of some of these lines inside of a year. And insofar as that helps us helps inform our understanding of ocean acidification, we really want to understand. The, something about the formation of these events and how long they last. Um, you know, do they get worse over time? Uh, when do they break up again at the end? And while it's still going to be a challenge for us to conduct operations in the winter, um, my hope is that if we add um, consistent ocean acidification sampling to the DBO, uh, that we'll, able, we'll be able to replicate the results uh, and the value of that Bering Sea project um, just by working well together, like you said. Yeah. Well, thank you again. It was an excellent presentation. Any other questions for Jessica or comments? No, Mr. Jack, I thought it was great. Um, could you send me the PowerPoint for the, or the PDF of this? This would be uh, very useful. But I did want to say that I thought that there's a lot of interest. I think the Koreans actually do some uh, certification measures, and as you said, the Chinese. And so I think at the, the TAG meeting uh, in China would be a good one to to uh, be able to continue on these discussions for the acidification part within the DBO. I, I completely agree with that, Jackie, and I, I hope that that goes forward. You know, in, in addition to talking about the Chinese and, and talking about the Korean delegation in COPRI, I don't want to leave out JAMSTEC. Um, JAMSTEC is doing some really unique stuff right now. Uh, they've developed a new method for examining um, shell dissolution where they can essentially take an MRI of these shells um, uh, and quantify the amount of dissolution that, that that's that shell has undergone, and the quantification is really the big deal in this case. Um, uh, you know, quantifying an impact on biological organisms can sometimes be pretty difficult, um, and, and that method is really going to move us uh, pretty far forward with that, and, that, and that's JAMSTEC as well. So we have um, multiple uh, Asian, Asian nations that are, that are all contributing to that effort. Okay, well, if there aren't more questions or comments, thanks again to you, Jessica.